All right, so we are recording now, and um, I've got the Nearpod open. So hopefully all of you are on looking at the Nearpod. You can hopefully all see this. Um, I know we've had a couple people just join us. Those of you that just joined us, you should follow the link to Nearpod, and you're going to want to watch the Nearpod as we go. So today we're talking about uh, the Cold War at home, and um, I've broken that down into kind of three categories of fear, espionage, and McCarthyism, okay? And so we'll talk about what each one of those means as we go. Um, we've talked about those terms already. Um, we talked about them when we started um, this unit on uh, the Cold War. We talked about especially what espionage means, because that was part of our definition of what makes a cold war that we reviewed uh, yesterday and we re made that the week before we left so um, hopefully that's fresh in your minds if not you're going to want to go back and watch the um, presentation from yesterday that's available on youtube okay but today we're looking at the cold war at home here in america what was happening so let's get started all right so you should have in front of you a kind of a poll question just gauging, making sure you can all interact with it. So go ahead and answer that. How, who's ready to learn? You should all be able to see that. And give me an idea of who's ready. Yeah. Those of you selecting that you haven't been awake this early, I, I, I hear that. It's an easy temptation to have for sure. All righty. All right, good. So just so you guys, you guys can see how the rest of your peers are feeling. Don't worry, your names aren't shown. Um, but there we go, we're ready. All right. So first of all, we're gonna talk about fear. Fear is the big first big thing um, and fear, becomes one of the one of if not the number one influencer um, of the American reaction to global events during this period right we're talking um, again we've talked about this the entire Cold War we historians ballpark it to 1945 to 1991 right so the end of World War II um, to the fall of the Soviet Union this period we're talking about today is going to span um, if you were with us yesterday, we uh, ended in 1952 with the election of 1952. Today is gonna kind of go backwards a little bit. We're still gonna be in the uh, 1940s during, uh, late 1940s during Truman's presidency. Uh, we will get up into the Eisenhower presidency into 52 and, and after that today as well. So today we're kind of dealing with a period of basically, I would say, ballparking between 1947 um, and roughly 1953, 54. Um, so that's where we're at. And you have to remember that a lot of global events have happened at this point, right? So you have, if you're an American and you're reading news, the newspaper, uh, listening to the radio, um, and you're hearing that you know, the Soviets have complete control in Eastern Europe. Um, we talked about this yesterday with the take communist takeover of China, right? When you find out that China has been taken over by communists, it all begins to feel overwhelming and fear becomes this major motivation and has this real grip over the world, right? Um, we know based on the enrollment records, those who signed up and, you know, historical research, we know that at the height of World War II, roughly 80,000 Americans were members of the Communist Party in the United States. That's about, oh, that's less than 1%, that's far less than 1%, as you can see there, it's 0.06% of the population of the United States. And yet, there was this overwhelming fear of the potential for communism to spread here in this country. And, and a major question is, uh, where did their loyalties lie? And we talked about this at the end of yesterday, 
but you have to remember President Truman is a Democrat. The Democrats have been in power uh, since um, 19, excuse me, 1932 when, when Roosevelt is elected. And so it's been quite a while that the Democrats have had control. And so Republican, uh, very conservative Republican congressmen are gonna begin to question Truman and the Democratic Party's efforts to really contain communism. Um, we talked about this yesterday, that many of them after uh, the fall of China to communism, many believed that Truman was to blame because Truman didn't send troops. And so was Truman uh, sympathetic to the communist cause? Was he really trying to end communism or was he in fact helping it? So there's this major fear that grips not only uh, the average citizen, um, but it also grips Congress, okay? Tomorrow, uh, when we look at some primary sources, we're gonna look at, um, there were trading cards made about the end of the world and nuclear fallout, um, just very similar to baseball cards. We'll look at some of those tomorrow. Um, we may even get to see the trailer. There's a movie made uh, later in the Cold War called uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Again, there's this overwhelming fear that communism's coming, that the world, you know, is coming to an end, and what are we going to do? And so there's a few responses I want to look at. First, we're going to look at President Truman's response. And President Truman, again, is under pressure, right? We talked about yesterday the issuing of NSC 68. Um, that becomes a major Cold War policy. But his other response in 1947, Truman responds to these pressures that he's a communist sympathizer by starting and establishing what, what is known as the Federal Employee Loyalty Program, as well as the Loyalty Review Board, okay? And the purpose of both of these was to investigate government employees and dismiss those found to be disloyal to the US government. Now, again, the target of this disloyalty is communists. Uh, we're gonna talk about at the end of this, some other uh, initially unintended victims um, of this fear and this invest these investigations into government employees, but the initial target is communists. And so the attorney general at the time, uh, he draws up a list of 11 subversive organizations, uh, subversive meaning that they are, um, they are undermining or they are dangerous to the American way right? And so membership in those groups was automatic grounds for suspicion. Now, that list of 11 grows to 91 organizations uh, before this is all said and done. And so some of these organizations include uh, groups like the NAACP, uh, a lot of um, Jewish heritage groups, a lot of um, ethnic groups, including, you know, Russian Americans, German Americans, um, a lot of it is, again, it's fear-based. It's not grounded in any sort of strong reality. It's, a lot of it is grounded in fear, okay? And so <clears throat> from 1947 to 1951, uh, this, these, these groups, the Federal Employee Loyalty Board and the Loyalty Review Board, uh, investigate 3.2 million federal employees, people working for the government. Out of those 3.2 million, 212 are dismissed as security risks. And another 2,900, almost 3,000 of them resign because they don't want to be investigated or they feel like it violates their constitutional rights to be investigated. They're citizens of the United States. They feel like if they're going to be investigated, they are subject to the rights afforded them in the Constitution, things like uh, the Fifth Amendment, that they're, they are uh, free from self-incrimination, um, that they, you know, other rights, that they have the right to know the charges against them. Um, and because a major piece of this whole investigative process was that they didn't get to know what evidence was gathered against them. If they were being investigated, you would think that, that you know, they had some evidence on you. Okay, so what's the evidence that is causing you to investigate me. Um, they didn't get to know that evidence. So that was um, kind of a major sticking point for a lot of them that they were not happy about. Um, 
and it and again it causes almost three thousand of them to just resign um without basically without cause uh they just didn't want to be investigated and they really had no other choice the second response I want to look at is Congress's response. And just a quick note, I know I'm, I'm, we're moving through these. Normally, you guys would be trying to write everything down. Um, I should have said this at the beginning, and I'm sorry I didn't. Please don't try to be writing everything down. All of this is going to be available to you to digitally. Um, it'll be on, it's already, or it will be on Google Classroom. You'll have access to all of it. Try not, if you're taking notes, try and write down maybe some, things I say that aren't on there that you want to remember. Um, but again, the recording of this is also going to be available. That's something that's not usually available when we have lecture in class, right? We don't normally record our lecture, uh, but all of this will be on there as well. Okay, so I'm going to be moving fairly quick, um, but um, there will be time. We'll have some time at the end. We can stop the recording and ask questions um, and whatnot. So anyway, going back to it, Congress's response. Congress is going to respond again. They don't trust Truman. Uh, and particularly, we're talking again, we're talking about Republican congressmen don't trust Truman's response. And the Democrats don't want to be lumped in as being weak on communism. So the House of Representatives starts this committee called the House Un American Activities Commu Committee, or HUAC. Okay. Um, and they are going to exist for the sole purpose of investigating uh, un-American activities within um, not only the government, right? The, we already have the other committees for the government, but HUAC is specifically looking throughout the rest of the country. And HUAC is gonna become famous, kind of first make headlines, uh, when they launch in 1947, their investigation into Hollywood, into the movie industry. Um, and their fear is that communists were sneaking propaganda into films. And this is, um, <laughs> this is just so typical of the time. The evidence that they had of this, uh, they cited were pro-Soviet films, films that were you know, in favor of the Soviet Union that were made during World War II, when the Soviets were our ally, right? So their World War II era films made shedding positive feelings about the Soviet Union, who was our ally. Um, and now the House Un-American Activities Community is pulling these up and saying, well, this is evidence that clearly there are communist lovers within Hollywood, so we need to investigate this. So they subpoena or, uh, you know, f formally command people to come and testify before them. Um, many of these are considered what, what would be called friendly witnesses, right? witnesses that are testifying um, that yes, indeed, Hollywood is just absolutely racked by these communists. Um, and, you know, we've encountered communism on the, on the sets. But of these 43 witnesses, 10 of them are considered unfriendly witnesses. They refuse to testify. Um, and there, you can see them pictured there, they get labeled the Hollywood 10. And these 10 are sent to prison for their failure to cooperate. Um, there's some great footage. Um, we don't have time today to watch, watch the footage, but there's some great footage of these uh, hearings. They're recorded. Um, and they basically, they walk in and these, these 10, they're all men, these 10 men basically say, what are you charging us with? Where's the evidence? Um, and when they're told that you know they don't get to know that information, they cite their Fifth Amendment freedoms, that they, that they have the right to say nothing, that they don't have to self-incriminate. They cite their uh, other rights, again, that they should get to know the charges against them. Um, and of course, if you are not cooperative in court or in uh, an official uh, congressional hearing like that, you can be held in contempt. And these, these 10 men were, uh, and they, again, they were sent to prison for their failure to cooperate. Um, what comes out of this, Hollywood has to respond. And so the Hollywood executives respond to these HUAC investigations uh, by creating a blacklist. And this blacklist is 
a list of 500 actors, writers, producers, and directors, all suspected of having communist sympathies, um, all suspected of um, either promoting pro-Soviet uh, agendas in their films or in their writings, um, or somehow being connected to the others who were. Um, and these 500 people are now entirely out of work. There's nothing to say that they were communists. There's nothing that says they, they weren't. But just because of somebody's hunch or this idea that maybe they are, um, they are no longer able to work, okay? Um, so here, let's watch this clip. Make sure your sound, and here we go. All right, so that gives you an idea. Uh, it's kind of what I was talking about. The again, just the defiance, the the unwillingness to to bend on their rights. They're American citizens, and uh, they felt that it was wrong that they were being dragged through this. But nonetheless, they are, um, and the Hollywood Ten are uh, imprisoned. The blacklist is made, and somebody who finds themselves on this uh, committee, brought before this committee is Lucille Ball. Uh, many of you hopefully know of this, the show, I Love Lucy. Again, this is one of those things lost on um, having to do this digitally. Um, I would love to show you some great clips from I Love Lucy, but the gist of the story here is that Lucille Ball, the actress who plays uh, Lucy Ricardo, finds herself brought before HUAC because uh, <laughs> because in the 1930s, while she was living in Los Angeles, she registered, as you can see there in that bottom uh, right corner, she registered as a member of the Communist Party. Um, now, Lucille Ball says, she testifies in front of HUAC that she only joined uh, to placate her socialist grandfather, that her grandfather uh, forced her into it. She, she didn't want to join. Um, she, in fact, says that she was ignorant, um, that she was never politically minded. Uh, we'll get to read some of this statement um, tomorrow, and this will be one of the documents we look at. But something that happens to Lucy that doesn't happen to many other people is Lucy is cleared. Um, she is not blacklisted. She is not put uh, on the same list as these other people. Here's the difference we know she registered as a member of the communist party we have the affidavit we have the proof here's a, here's an individual where there's actual proof that they were at least a registered member of the communist party um which is far more evidence than they had on anybody else and yet she's let off and i don't want to go into details about it today um again kind of drag you guys into tomorrow um, but there's a very interesting reason why Lucy, why it's believed that Lucille Ball is let off the hook. So um, we will look at that tomorrow again. I don't want to ruin the surprise. Um, but I want you guys to tell me, what do you guys think? Here's another poll. You guys are going to have 30 seconds. You tell me, was Lucille Ball a communist or not? What do you think? you don't have a ton of evidence to go off of, which is kind of the answer, but kind of the point. But let's see.
All right. So half of you answered. Okay, half of you answered and more than half of you, here we go. A lot of you said 100%, you think she's a communist. So this is good. Um, the quote there from Desi Arnaz, for those of you who don't know who Desi Arnaz is, Desi Arnaz uh, was her real life husband uh, for a time, as well as her co-star on I Love Lucy. He played uh, Ricky Ricardo. Um, and he says that the only thing read about her is her hair, and even that's not real. Um, so just a comical line. Again, we'll read more about Lucy, Lucille Ball tomorrow. Um, but here's, again, an example of somebody where there's real evidence that she was probably, at, at the very least, she's a member of the Communist Party, and yet she is let off the hook um, in a very public way. HUAC comes out and issues a public statement clearing her, and we'll look at that tomorrow. All right. So you should have in front of you a, a quick activity. I just want to make sure we're tracking uh, with what's happening. So hopefully you should be um, being asked to fill in the blanks. So go ahead and start this activity. I just want to make sure you're tracking with, I've thrown a lot at you so far. Go ahead and try these. So you should just have to drag and drop. Remember, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat on Zoom. Let me give you guys just a couple more seconds. Finish that up. All right, so let's see here. It should have told you how you did. It should have told you how, if you got them. So we'll move on. If you didn't get them, um, or here, we'll, we can go back. Um, so that first one, blank is the number one influencer, influencer of American reaction to global events. That should have been fear. Uh, the purpose of the Federal Employee Loyalty Program and the Loyalty Review Board was to investigate government employees and to dismiss those found to be disloyal to the U.S. government. And then the last one, the House Un-American Activities Committee first made headlines in 1947 with its investigation into the movie industry. Okay, this should have been the answers you got. Hopefully it gave you that feedback. All right, so we're going to move on to... Our second topic, we've covered fear. Now we're gonna look at espionage. Everyone's favorite uh, thing about the Cold War, uh, spies, right? We dramatize this a lot. We, we make movies about, you know, James Bond and um, we have even in, you know, like Marvel superhero movies, you have Black Widow who starts off as a, as a Russian spy. Um, we are, as a culture, we are obsessed with mysteries and spy novels and movies about spies. Um, and here is some real life spies, right? Um, I'm hoping we are back together uh, in class when we get to the second half here of the Cold War 
um, because there's some great, great spy stuff that happens uh, with Fidel Castro and Cuba um, during the latter years of uh, the Cold War that I would love to be able to cover in class. But here in the early parts of the Cold War, um, America is really going to be rocked by two cases. We're going to look at two case studies today. Um, and those are the cases of Alger Hiss and Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Um, these are, both of these are going to be accused um, of being Soviet spies, um, and we'll see how they turn out. So first we're going to look at Alger Hiss. Okay, so um, Nearpod's kind of weird. It's blocking, your, it's not going to show you the pictures of uh, Whitaker Chambers. Um, but when you go back in to the slides that I'll post in Google Classroom, you can see the picture. Um, there's a picture of Whitaker Chambers on here as well as Alger Hiss. I'll explain the picture that you can see in a minute. But in 1948, basically what we have is a, a known communist spy, Whitaker Chambers, um, is testifying and he accuses Alger Hiss of also being a communist. And at the time that he accuses Alger Hiss of being a communist, the world is kind of shocked because Hiss, uh, he had been a lawyer under the Roosevelt administration. He was a, he defended New Deal programs um, in, in court and in the Supreme Court. Eventually he went on to work for the State Department in China in 1939. Um, and everyone's kind of shocked. And Chambers says, no, I have proof. He gives them what's called, he gives the government a microfilm, which has these documents that he claims are typed on Hess's typewriter. And that's the image you see here on the screen. This is what this is a microfilm machine reader. So if you were to go to your public library, or even if you go to the Fresno State Library today, um, these microfilms, if you see that little reel of film uh, right under the screen, if you look under the, the screen of that, that machine, there's a little wheel of film on the left side. And basically what this is, is there, it's a film reel of pictures of documents, right? Rather than pictures of people and whatnot, they can be pictures of people, um, but it's basically scans of documents. And you can go and you can use this machine and you can look at um, these documents. And then, you know, nowadays you can digitally transfer them to a computer and print them off, which is what you're looking at here. Um, but I'll show you a picture in a second. Before you would just view them and you could make prints of them uh, similar to how you would develop pictures. but uh, basically, Chambers passes off this microfilm and says, look, these are all documents typed on Hiss's typewriter, um, and these are all documents that have been leaked to the Soviets. And Alger Hiss is eventually convicted by HUAC of perjury. So he's not, commit he's not convicted of espionage. They can't prove that he actually, you know, uh, gave these documents to um, to the Soviets or that they were ever given there, but they know that Whitaker Chambers has them. And how did Whitaker Chambers get them? Well, he says Hiss gave them to him. So at, le at the very least, Hiss is lying about passing the documents to Whitaker Chambers. And so Hiss is convicted of perjury, which is lying under oath, uh, for lying about passing the documents on. And this whole uh, investigation brings to the forefront of the American public's eye this young conservative Republican congressman who's a hardline anti-communist, Richard Nixon, uh, out of California. He rises to fame in the national eye for his role in, this, in pursuing these charges against his. And in fact, it's only four years later that he finds himself vice president of the United States. Uh, this is one of those moments that really catapults his career, brings him to the forefront. You can see there in that picture, he's on the right. He's examining the microfilm. Uh, he's using a magnifying glass, just looking at what's on there. Um, but for his part, Hiss uh, maintained his innocence. Even after he was convicted, he, he continued to say he was innocent, that it was uh, the documents were forgeries. Um, but in the 1990s, <clears throat> The Soviets released some records of their um, Cold War era, you know, 
spying and whatnot. And the documents that they released seem to prove that Hiss was in fact um, a Soviet spy and that he was in fact guilty. Um, and this would make Hiss the only real spy ever convicted by Congress during the Red Scare. We're gonna talk about a guy named Joseph McCarthy at the end of this, um, at the end of our time today. Joseph McCarthy is well known for his part in the Red Scare. He's a senator uh, and he did his work in Senate committees. Um, but in his entire time, spoiler alert, um, McCarthy catches zero spies. Uh, Richard Nixon, who does not make his career off of, you know, hunting down communists, um, he catches one, Alger Hiss, um, and he catches the only one uh, versus McCarthy, who's going to try and make his career off of this. Um, we'll talk about him in a minute. Um, but if you're, if you're looking for the totals here, spies caught, um, Nixon has one so far. Um, McCarthy will have zero, spoiler alert. Um, and then these next two we're going to talk about, these get credited to Truman and Eisenhower ultimately. So the Rosenbergs are the second case that kind of rocks not only our country, but uh, rocks the world really. Uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, uh, they're both born to Jewish immigrant families in New York. They both joined the Communist Party, the CPUSA in the 1930s, got married in June of 39, had two children, and they were raising them in the Lower East Side of New York. Um, kind of your just normal American family. Um, on the outside, uh, Ethel was a stay-at-home mom when she had the kids, uh, but prior to that she used to work in, she was in government work, she did clerical work in the government offices. But in 1942, Julius Rosenberg um, agreed to become a spy for the KGB. And he was given the code name Antenna, uh, later changed to liberal, which is funny, uh, his code name Antenna, because he was working in a radio factory. Um, and he was passing along, the first thing he was passing along was uh, radio parts and radio signal kind of new technology they had there. But really Julius's main role was as a collect, as a as a kind of coordinator. He was a group leader. He his job was bringing in other spies who would do the real kind of spy work and passing on the information. He was really best known for just being a ringleader. Well, then <laughs> September third, nineteen forty nine, the Soviet Union explodes an atomic bomb. And this happens about three to five years earlier than American scientists predicted the Soviets would be able to explode a bomb. And so it immediately raises the question of, did they have help, right? The entire country is already fearful that uh, there are spies in their midst, that, that you know, the communists are invading the country anyway. And so now the Soviets have a nuclear bomb. Who helped them? And in 1950, German-born physicist living in the United States, Klaus Fuchs, is investigated and he admits to giving the Soviets information about the A-bomb, particularly about a trigger mechanism. And this trigger mechanism leads the federal government into investigating a guy named David Greenglass. You can see him there in the bottom right. He's Ethel Rosenberg's younger brother. And he was in the military assigned to uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. He was part of the Manhattan Project. We talked about that during our World War II unit, right? The project to develop the nuclear bomb. And he in particular was assigned to a, per a portion of the project that was working on the trigger mechanism. And that trigger mechanism um, was kind of critical to being able to actually launch the weapon and use it. And so David Greenglass is investigated and he ends up telling the government that, you know what, um, yes, I took this information, um, but it was to give to my brother-in-law and my sister. So he implicates Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, says it was all their idea. Uh, he, gave, he gave it to them, but you know he was just doing what he thought he had to do because he felt compelled. Um, 
And oh, by the way, his wife had already testified and his wife gave a completely different story. But, you know, David Greenglass makes up a new story to get her off the hook, get him off the hook, and instead puts his sister and her husband uh, square in the eye of the federal government. So the FBI arrests them on July 17th, 1950. They, of course, denied the charges. They invoked their Fifth Amendment right. They claim they're being targeted simply because they're Jewish and they were known communists. They didn't try to deny it. They just said it was, you know, this was basically a witch hunt and a hate crime. But unfortunately for them, uh, they are found guilty. March 29th, 1951, a jury finds them guilty of conspiracy to commit espionage and sentences that, and a judge later sentences them to death. And they were in fact executed by electric chair um, on June 19th, 1953. Now, I want to pause here for a second. Hopefully, those of you that joined us yesterday, some of these dates, some of this timeline is sticking out to you. We're going to look at, in a second, why this timeline matters. But I want you to note, note here that they were not convicted of espionage. They were not convicted of treason. Um, they were convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage. So I want you to answer real quick. You're going to have, just take a minute. I want you to think real quick before I start this. You're going to have a minute. I want you to tell me what you think conspiracy means. Okay. What does conspiracy mean? If, if they were convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage, what does that mean? Ready? Go. Let's go ahead and type your answers in. All right, so let's see. All right, so somebody, one of you said, conspiracy is the thought or idea of something not appearing what it seems to be good. Okay, good. Uh, let's see, conspiracy is when two or more people will commit a crime in the future. Conspiracy could mean like you have a secret plan to do something an agreement between people to commit a crime. Good. Okay. So all of these are good answers, right? This idea that, again, they weren't committed of, they weren't convicted of espionage. They weren't convicted of treason. They were convicted of conspiracy to commit so that they were planning or conspiring uh, in the future to maybe commit these crimes. Um, there was no evidence particularly against Ethel Rosenberg. Uh, there was no evidence that she um, was in fact a spy. In fact, we now know, again, because of Soviet release documents, we now know Ethel Rosenberg never even had a code name. Um, and if she didn't have a code name, she probably wasn't a spy. We know that uh, Julius had one. We know that uh, Greenglass had one um, and the whole host of other conspirators that they that they worked with all had code names, but Ethel didn't. In fact, her sister-in-law did. And that's why we believe Greenglass was really covering for himself and his wife because they were both uh, eventually implicated in these Soviet documents. Um, Ethel Rosenberg more than likely 
knew exactly what her husband was doing, but was never actually involved in the actual activities. But nonetheless, she is executed. And something I want you to see, um, this, is a, this is a cartoon that comes out um, called His Famous Smile. And this is, for those of you maybe less familiar with him, this is an image of President Dwight Eisenhower. Um, and this is a famous image that comes out. I added the yellow box to draw your attention to his teeth um, because his teeth, if, for those of you who can see it, um, they are electric chairs, right? So the artist, uh, Louis Middleburg, has replaced his teeth with electric chairs. Um, and this is a direct response to uh, the killing, the executions of the Rosenbergs. And something I need you to see is that one of the driving factors behind the conviction and execution of the Rosenbergs is the Korean War. We talked about the Korean War yesterday, right? And we talked about the, the timeline of the Korean War. We're not going to rehash that right now, but something I need you to see is, again, if you're an average American and you're getting these reports, um, in 1949, that the Soviets have a bomb, and then all of a sudden in June of 1950, you're, you now know that American troops are engaged uh, in this war in Korea, or this fight in Korea through the United Nations, right? Well, then all of a sudden you find out that these two Americans are being accused of, uh, you know, spying. Well, it all comes together and your fe the fear takes over. If we, put the, if we look at the timeline again, even closer, uh, right about the time the Chinese joined the war, right after General MacArthur has pushed here in November, 20, you know, November of 1950, as he's pushed to the edge of China, the Yalu River, when the Chinese joined the war, it's very soon after this that the Rosenbergs are actually convicted. And again, this overwhelming fear of the spread of communism, of what's happening around the world, the Rosenbergs are directly blamed for Korea. They, the, the people during the trial say that if they hadn't passed along the trigger, the Soviets wouldn't have got the bomb, and therefore they wouldn't have encouraged uh, the North Koreans to invade. Now, as we talked about yesterday, the only evidence we have of Stalin ever even uh, talking to the North Koreans about this is when the North Koreans asked for permission to invade and Stalin's reply was to go talk to Mao in China. And if Mao would back him, uh, back the um, North Koreans, then they could go for it. Um, and like I told you guys yesterday, we have no evidence that uh, the North Koreans ever asked China or that China ever gave them the approval. We just know that in earlier in 1950, the Soviets tell them, go for it if China's on board, and then by June, they're going for it. So um, this whole theory that the Rosenbergs caused the Korean War is really nonsense, but that's the fear that grips the judge, that's the fear that grips the country, and they are convicted. There's a global outcry, we don't have time to get into it. Um, there's a great book I can suggest to you if you're interested in it. Um, but there's a global outcry. There's, there's um, protests all over the world uh, for years, from the time they're convicted until they're executed, and then even after their execution, calling for their release, calling for them to be set free. This idea that they haven't even committed treason, they haven't been convicted of espionage, they've been convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage, and they're getting the death penalty feels very heavy to a lot of people around the world and in the country. There are people pleading with Truman, and then eventually, uh, after Eisenhower is elected in 52, people pleading with Eisenhower to, to stop this execution, um, and neither of them does. And so the Rosenbergs are killed, and that has a major impact on the American public in terms of how they view this whole issue of espionage and the reality of its close closeness to home. So, all right. I know, again, I know we're moving quickly. Thank you for 
hanging in there. I've been checking the chat. Doesn't look like there's any questions. So I'm going to keep going. Um, we're going to, you know, respect your time, get you out of here at noon. Uh, so with McCarthyism, Joseph McCarthy is a Republican senator from Wisconsin. Um, he spends the first three years of his his time as a senator really doing nothing, um, nothing to his nothing to kind of write home about. He's not really well known, um, and so he's coming up for reelection. He knows he needs to make a big splash, needs to get reelected, um, and so on Lincoln Day in 1950 in Wheeling, West Virginia, he gives this speech where he denounces the Democrats' effort to stop the spread of communism. Again, he's jumping on that bandwagon that Truman and the Democrats are being easy on communists. And he comes out and he says, he holds up this paper, he says he has a list of 205 names of State Department employees who are either suspected or known communists. And he tells the people in Wheeling, West Virginia, that he gave these names to Secretary of State Dean Acheson, uh, a Democrat, again, um, and he did nothing. And that, you know, now he was going to go on this crusade, he being McCarthy, was going to go on this crusade to expose these uh, government workers and these communists who'd infiltrated the government, right? He writes this telegram, which you see there in the top right corner. We're going to look at his telegram tomorrow, as well as um, an unsent response from President Truman. Um, but he sends this telegram to President Truman, uh, basically recounting, saying, I gave this speech. And in there, he says that he has a list of 57 known communists. Now, mind you, in his speech the day before, he holds up a list and says, I have 205 names. And over time, this 205 is at sometimes 57 names, other times he talks about it, it's 81 names. It changes all the time. And so there's really, you know, Democrats really don't know what to do with him. He keeps going on these speaking engagements and he's saying the Democrats have engaged uh, in 20 years of treason um, and that they've just, they've been plotting all of this. Now, mind you, he only says all of this on the floor of the Senate so that he can't be accused of, you know, uh, crimes um, for, you know, he's protected from uh, being accused of things like libel or um, defamation, right? Because he's in his official role as a senator, he's on the Senate floor, and therefore he can't be charged with the crime. And so Republicans kind of let McCarthy do his thing. The Republicans don't really try and stop him. There's a lot that don't agree with his tactics. There's a lot that don't like him. But they kind of let him go because what they think is they think it's going to help them in 52 to win the White House. And so McCarthy goes on, he holds all these hearings, and eventually he decides he's going to take on the U.S. Army. And this is his downfall. This idea of what McCarthy is doing is known as McCarthyism, right? And we, we specifically call it something McCarthyism when it involves the unfair accusing of people of disloyalty without providing evidence. Again, he's doing all of this on the Senate floor. He can't be held accountable for um, things like defamation or libel, um, and which is saying things that you know are false that hurt somebody's credibility. And he engages in this and he takes on the US Army. He accuses the US Army of being infiltrated by communists. And the U.S. Army uh, strikes back, and they accuse this committee uh, counsel, the lawyer for this committee, uh, Roy, Ray Cohn, of blackmail, right? That, he's, that they're, he's blackmailing the U.S. Army. And so these hearings are li held live on TV. And I know this, doesn't, this isn't a big deal for a lot of us today. I mean, all of you have had TV since you've been alive. Right, the TV is not a new invention for you. It wasn't a new invention for me. I had I grew up with TV, also, but this idea at the time in 1954 of live broadcast hearings um, was a big deal, and so for two months, for two months from uh, for through April through through the beginning of June, approximately 20 million Americans watch gavel to gavel, beginning to end these hearings of what come to be known as the Army McCarthy hearings, and they watch this Senator McCarthy 
behave in ways that are absolutely combative. They're not honorable. Uh, and he takes on the institution of the American army, which we'll talk about in a second, isn't generally a good idea. Um, we're gonna skip, for the sake of time, it's already 1154, we're gonna skip the video, but again, you can go into the, to the slides on Google Classroom and watch this video of, it's a clip of his behavior in these hearings as well as the army's response. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna skip the video. But basically what ends up happening is by the time these two months have passed and the uh, hearings are done, right? Um, McCarthy has successfully alienated the American people. If you didn't know, the American people tend to really support their military. We really like to support our, our troops. And watching this senator uh, rake the army over the coals is not something that the American people enjoy. And so by the end of it, McCarthy has lost the support of the American people. He's lost the support of his senators. They formally censure him, uh, which is like a formal disapproval, formal rebuke um, for what they call improper conduct that tended to bring the Senate into dishonor and disrepute. He never really recovers from this. And he eventually, uh, within three years, is actually, he dies uh, from complications of alcoholism. He begins or continues to drink heavily, uh, even more heavily than prior, never really recovers. His career is really ended because of this, and he eventually dies. Now, at the same time McCarthy is holding these hearings, we have what's called, the, what's become known as the Lavender Scare happening. This is the last thing we're going to talk about. Um, we're probably going to run out of time to do the closing activity. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this quickly and then we'll, we'll close. But basically, um, again, I can give you recommendations for a book. There's a movie done of this as well. Um, but in 1950, the undersecretary of the State Department comes out and says, hey, look, McCarthy says that there's communists in our midst. I promise you the State Department has not hired communists. We don't have communists. In fact, we just fired several employees. We did our own check. Uh, we deem them to be security risk, and among them, 91 were homosexuals. And instead of this alleviating people's fears in the country, what it ends up doing is it kickstarts this concentrated effort to rid the government of any homosexual employees. Um, the State Department and other government officials come out and they say that they are fear, they fear that, you know, uh, those who live a homosexual lifestyle are sexual deviants that their lifestyle makes them vulnerable to blackmail and therefore the Soviet Union could use them, could blackmail them into spying. Again, there's no evidence of this. There's nothing that anybody's done. It just becomes this fear piece. And during the same period that McCarthy is leading his witch hunt for communists, what we know as the second Red Scare, um, we actually know that more homosexuals or suspected homosexuals are removed from their jobs uh, than those suspected of being communists. Um, which has led some scholars to label this era the Lavender Scare rather than uh, the Red Scare. Um, that is like the shortest version of it. Um, here you can see these are some headlines um, as well as uh, some images from protests that took place. Um, that's the book there in the center if you want to, if you are interested. Um, but basically it's the, that's the shortest version of this is that during the same time that we've called the Red Scare, in fact, less communists were found and removed from their jobs than people who were accused of being uh, homosexuals. So why do I bring that up? I bring that up because again, there's this rampant fear of anything that seems uh, to be counter to what would be the quote unquote American norm. And unfortunately, the American people grab onto this idea of an American norm and they run with it. And anything that doesn't fit that mold, whether it's an ethnic minority um, or a social minority, as in this case, um, they persecute it, they go after it, they try and get rid of it during this time. And it leads to a lot of social disruption, which we'll talk about uh, more tomorrow when we look at some documents. Um, and we'll look at more 
on Friday when we look at kind of the political response to all this. But uh, for now, we're gonna skip that one. Um, I want you to start or to finish with this. So once you're done with this activity, it gives you two minutes. Uh, once you are finished with this, um, if you don't have any questions, you guys can go ahead and um, sign off. I'll put a message in Google Classroom uh, to give you guys some updates. Um, there's a homework assignment I want you to do. Um, but um, yeah, if you have questions, what we'll do is I'll, when the two minutes is up, I'll, uh, I'll stop the recording and then we can go back to the Zoom window and uh, if you have questions, we can talk about them. All right, thank you guys. For those of you that came, thank you for coming. Hopefully you learned something. Um, again, once you complete this activity, if you have no questions, you can go ahead and sign off. Those of you that have questions, hang, in the, hang on there and then we'll end the recording and go back over to Zoom. Cool. All right, so for those of you that are still on here, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna stop the recording now.